please, on this sheet of paper, put your name and then what you're going to bring to uh, next Thursday's Thanksgiving dinner that we're having here. <laughs> Uh, actually, I was like a week off in, in all my scheduling. I did not think, in, in my mind, Thanksgiving was not next week, but the week after next. So it was kind of a shock when I realized, just like maybe a couple days ago, that next week is Thanksgiving already, you know. So at any rate, uh, we actually, after today, we actually have three classes. Okay, not a lot. All right. Um, today we're going to cover what we're covering today, obviously. Um, the last class before the end of the semester, which would be two weeks from today, we will discuss the final exam and we'll have a review for the final exam and any additional time that we have we'll devote to working on your project and getting your project, getting your final exam questions answered, your project uh, questions answered, and all that. Between now and then, what we're going to talk, and, and so that will leave us then two other classes. Tuesday coming up, and the following Tuesday. Between those, we'll cover a lot of sort of the, what I call the advanced topics, additional topics, and we also want to cover the switchboard. So that's a, that's a big one that we want to cover. And I'm not really sure um, um, exactly the sequence we'll cover them in. You know, I have them in my notes. We'll see how it goes. We'll see what questions that we have, uh, and, and we'll just do that. So again, today, Tuesday, no class on Thursday, the next Tuesday, we're covering advanced stuff and the switchboard and that kind of stuff. The last class will be a review for the final and will be, um, you know, project time if you have questions about that. You probably should bring your project with you uh, just in case if we run short on time, like if, if, if we wrap up a few minutes early and I don't want to start another topic, uh, I'm likely to say, well, let's just go work on our projects. Um, the, uh, the thought is that, what is the thought? Oh, the, the, you know, what you're doing for your project is important and we want to make sure that that's really good. So I, I'm happy to uh, take the time to answer whatever project questions that you have either in class or in lab. Uh, let me pull up my notes here to talk about some advanced things and again keeping in mind as I'm talking about these advanced things, these are not necessarily things that Access does, but things that are uh, features of uh, more robust relational databases. All right. A couple of these things we've alluded to already, and we're just going to maybe talk about them in a more, more formal sense. First one is a notion of a transaction. All right. Now, a transaction in a, in a database sense has a very specific meaning. In order to do that, let's consider a scenario. Tomorrow's payday for me, you know. I remember when I was young and, and foolish, payday was always a great celebration day, you know, it was always a big deal. Now it's a lot less so because, you know, payday is also pay the bills day, all right? So it becomes less of a big deal, you know. It goes in, but it, it goes out pretty quick as well. At any rate, one of the things that I'm apt to do on payday is to transfer money from one account to another. All right? And you can do all this stuff online. It's great. All right? So let's say at a bank, I have a checking account and I have a savings account. All right? And I'm going to talk about it on a conceptual level first before we actually get down and look at it on a database level. All right? But on a conceptual level, let's say my checking account has $500 in it and my savings account has $1,000 in it. Let's say I want to transfer $250 from checking to savings. All right? Now, what is going to happen when I do that transfer? I'll go in and I, you know, I'll have a little form that looks like this that will say, you know, what's the amount? 250. From which account? I could actually bring up my, my banking screen, but 
uh, that's probably not a good idea to do on, on, on uh, in being recorded. But the screen looks almost exactly like this. I'm going to transfer from this, uh, this amount, from one account, so I'm going to transfer from checking to savings. There might be something else, and there's a button that says submit. So when I press that button, two things happen conceptually. And when we think about it, two things are happening SQL-wise as well. All right? When I click this, what's happening? The checking account is going to be decreased by 250, bringing it down to 250. And the savings is going to go down, or is going to go up to, to 1250. So my one action actually causes two things to happen. It goes out of one account and into the other account, right? Now, let's imagine, if we will, something going wrong. All right, here's bad scenario one. Bad for me. All right, I have my $500 in here, $1,000 in here. I say I want to transfer 250 from checking the savings. Let's say this happens. And in the middle, before it has a chance to update uh, the savings account, their database server crashes. Just crashes. And that never gets updated. That's not very good for me, right? Because 250 came out of my checking, but did not go into my savings. I'm not a very happy camper. Let's look at bad scenario two, which is bad for the bank. Same scenario. Let's say, hypothetically, the transaction worked in the other order, and it updated my checking account to add the 250 to it, but same thing, before it got around to updating the checking account to take the 250 out, their database server crashed, someone unplugged it, um, someone asked the question, what does this button do? <laughs> Any number of scenarios, and it crashed, and that checking account didn't get updated. Now, either one of those is bad, right? Either one of those is bad. In terms of SQL, what's going on here? In terms of SQL, and again, this is a vast oversimplification, keep in mind, all right? But let's say we have a transaction table. That transaction table might have a transaction ID as a primary key. And this maybe is an auto number. It might have the account number in it. There's probably an account table whose key is account number. One of the fields in that is probably the customer ID, right, which relates to the customer table. But, uh, so we have our customer table relates to the account table. The account table relates to the transaction table. The transaction table probably has, again, a transaction ID, which is an auto number, has an account number, has an amount, and maybe, you know, probably the date that it was made, and maybe some other things. All right? That's probably what the transaction table looks like. So in other words, if you want a balance of an account, you go and you add up all the transactions. That's how you do it in a normalized database. All right? Now, what does this transfer translate to in terms of SQL statements? It translates into 
two inserts into this table. Right? An insert to take a, an, an insert into this table for a transaction to take the money out of my checking. So uh, one to the checking account for an amount of negative 250. And then another insert to the savings account for a positive 250. Everyone's happy it balances, right? The negative and positive balance. All right. Now, in the case of the computer crashing at some point, the database server crashing or, or problems or whatever, if only one of these inserts happen, it's one of these bad scenarios. Bad for me, bad for the bank. This brings us to the notion of a transaction. All right? The notion of a transaction. And we kind of alluded to this before. We talked a little bit about it when we talked about stored procedures. But a transaction, we want to treat a group of SQL statements like a unit. All right? Uh, I think they use the word atomicity, that that's atomic. Uh, this is back when the idea that you couldn't split an atom. I think the word atomic comes from that you can't split it, although we know now that, that that's not true. But at any rate, um, a transaction is atomic. That is, you can't split it. Which means that either the transaction completely succeeds or the transaction completely fails. So, let's, I'm, I'm going to write a general scheme of the way that a transaction would work. And I'm not going to write it in any particular language. This could be a stored procedure. This could be within an application language. But essentially, you do something like this. you'd start your transaction. And what that means is everything from the point that you start it until the end of the transaction is either is treated as a unit. It's all going to work or it's all going to fail. All right? So, I would start the transaction. I would insert into the checking account to take the money out. I would check to see if it worked. If it succeeded or if I got some kind of error message. I would then insert into checking account, or in, I'm sorry, in the savings account, the positive 250. Check to see if it worked. If both worked, I would commit the transaction. Think of the word commit as being to finalize a transaction. To say, yep, it's done, everything worked, we're done with this transaction, it's finalized. Otherwise, we roll back. And what do I mean by roll back? We roll back to, we effectively reverse any of the SQL statements in this transaction that worked. We undo them. You know, think of a rollback as being the database's undo button. Undo everything that happened, everything that successfully happened since the start of the transaction. All right? So, hey, if I try to transfer money from my checking to my savings account, and that transfer doesn't work because there's a problem with the database. Okay, that's fine. I'll try again later. I still have that money in my checking account. It didn't go out of my checking account and disappear. All right. So, while I might be a little annoyed, I'm going to be nowhere near as annoyed as if it took it out of the checking and didn't put it into the saving. So, that's the notion of a transaction. A transaction, and they, they happen all the time in database processing. And again, they can happen within stored procedures. They can happen within application languages. But you start a transaction, you do a list of things, then you either commit or you roll it back. Commit means finalize it, everything went OK. You roll it back, which means undo everything. Um, can anyone think of another example of where you would need to use this sort of thinking, this sort of processing, transaction processing? Whereas everything succeeds or everything fails.
Well, I was an accounting minor, all right? That means that there's one thing I remember about accounting that people that weren't accounting minors probably don't know, and that is what? Your debit's got to match your credits, <laughs> all right? I remember that, you know? So, journal entries could be big, all right? I don't know, have any of you had an accounting class ever? No, you had? Journal entries can be big, right? There can be a whole, you know, it's not necessarily taking it out of one account and putting it in the other. If, for example, you, you know, if you are writing your weekly payroll checks, you might, the money comes out of cash, your checking account, and the money goes into the expense for each branch maybe. Maybe you have payroll broken down by branch, so you keep track of, of how much you pay at each branch. So that could be a gigantic journal entry. I mean, uh, most of my early career was working on applica uh, accounting applications, all right, and general ledger applications, all right. And again, you know, if something didn't balance, you know, that was catastrophic. You know, that that was, you know, pull the brakes, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, stop the engines. You know, we have to go and we have to hunt it down and find exactly what's wrong. That's the whole basis of accounting is everything adds up. And again, these journal entries can be long, but again, they all need to process as a unit. If you create a journal entry that balances debits and credits, that whole journal entry needs to be posted. Every account that's supposed to be hit needs to be hit. All right? And either it all succeeds or it all fails. Either one is acceptable. We certainly want it to succeed. We want our journal entry to be taken, but um, if, if it doesn't go, we don't want it to partially go. We want it to either entirely succeed or to en entirely fail. All right? Any questions on that? Um, again, they're, they're pretty typical uh, in, in larger applications because, again, for a lot of these things, you want to treat a block of SQL statements as, as a unit. Uh, Boy, actually talking about that brings back a lot of memories. We actually weren't using a relational database back then. We were using uh, uh, the equivalent of flat files. And again, it's great that databases have built in that capability, right? So me as a programmer don't have to write an undo if it fails, all right? That's already, that mechanism is already in databases that support transactions to roll back. Now, you might ask yourself, you know, look, you know, I hear what he's saying, but what are the chances that the database is going to crash right in the middle of me transferring my $250 from checking to savings? Well, if you wait long enough, everything happens, right? Um, if you think of a bank or, or a large organization that deals with thousands of transactions daily, and uh, my, my uh, statement of the database crash is just one example of potential problems that could occur. All right? It could be of any variety of, of, uh, of different issues. But when you consider that over time, processing that many transactions, a lot of odd, weird occurrences are going to happen. And when you add to that, the idea that, you know, a, a bank's lifeblood is its reliability, right, and its ability to process transactions. If even one of these happened, you know, does, does a bank want to even be 99% accurate with their transactions? No. They want to be a lot higher than that because they can't afford to blow one transaction out of 100, right, you know. That would, that, would be, that would be a death sentence to a bank if they, if they allowed that many sort of errors to occur. So again, although it may seem unlikely, given the volume of transaction over a longer period of time and the sensitive nature of the transaction, you don't want it to go bad. You, know, you don't want ever that sort of scenario of it came out of my account but didn't go into the other account. You don't ever want that sort of thing to happen. So that's why this is important. All right? Um, any questions about that? The next thing that we're going to talk about are issues of concurrency. All right? And again, concurrency is also, yes? Just out of curiosity, how would you write a SQL statement for a transaction? Or would that just, would that only be an application for 
that would that would pro typically live in a uh, in an application program. In other words, how would you write that? Yeah, you wouldn't be just at the, you know, in query mode writing inserts into the transaction table. Yeah, you you, you wouldn't uh, you wouldn't need to do that. Now there could be, for example. Um, there could be an application that ran, ran through maybe an uh, 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 applied service charges. You know, that would be an example of, of the application generating it based on some calculation. It would generate what the service charge was or pay interest on a, on a savings account or whatever. But yeah, you wouldn't be at the prompt writing a SQL statement like that to go and process that. That, that would live within some application code. And it might be a web application. Right, where I bring up my bank account on a web page and I go and do that. When I click submit, back at the server, there's SQL statements firing off. But yeah, typically that kind of thing. Most of the SQL statements that, that are going to run are going to be embedded in applications. On occasion, you will need to run SQL statements if you're doing some special things, like last time we talked about converting data and cleaning up data. Those are the kinds of statements that you might run from the prompt or maybe some unusual queries that need to be done. But for the most part, the, the SQL that we're talking about uh, done on a regular basis will be typically um, part of an application, will be embedded right into the application. Have any of you done Visual Basic coding? Yeah? Did you? Pardon me? We're in the class right now. Oh, you're in the class right now. Okay. Have you done any database uh, stuff? Okay, yeah. Well, again, at the root of it, you had a database query that was embedded in your SQL statement or in your in your VB application. You had these SQL statements embedded in your VB application, and again, it might have been very straightforward just to pull out a query. You might have even used a tool to create the query, like a QBE tool. I, I don't know how if or if you wrote it by hand, but. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it probably, yeah, probably the tool probably did it for you. But you could go in and write your own SQL statement. But just as you do that, you could write, you know, you've done programs with text boxes and drop downs, right? You could hook like a button that you click on to take the value from a drop box, take a value from a text uh, box, and, and do an insert statement into a database or retrieve a value from a database or whatever. So, yeah. Um, yeah, really, really cool stuff. And in, in, a, in the web classes I teach, and some of them anyhow, we deal with database interactivity where the SQL statements are built into the server code, not, not, the, not the web page that the user sees, but the, uh, on the server side that goes, does its thing and, and produces the results. So um, a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of cool stuff you can do with that. Um, next thing I want to talk about are issues of concurrency. And issues of concurrency are, are similar to the issues of transactions um, in the sense that they're not very likely. All right? Uh, you know, we're going to be talking about two people updating the same thing at the same time. All right? Well, what are the chances of that? Well, I don't know. What are the chances of that? But given enough transactions, given enough time, you run the potential of, of uh, uh, having issues. All right. The idea of concurrency would go something like this. Let's say I had um, an an employee record. And a, a row, uh, an employee uh, table. And maybe, you know, keys of employee ID. We'll put a first name, last name, phone number, and hourly wage rate in that table. So, let's imagine that we have a guy. Employee number 100, his name is Bill, Bill Myers. His phone number is this. 
and he's making $15 per hour. All right. Let's say there's two transactions that come down the pike. Let's say Bill moved, so he's changing his phone number. And let's say that uh, Bill gets a raise to $17 per hour. Now, to describe the problem, I'm going to describe a very simplistic scenario here. Let's say at the same time, person in human resources pulls up Bill's information and a person from payroll pulls up Bill's information. So we have our two screens here. Each have Bill's information on them. Bill Myers. Here's his phone number. And he makes $15 per hour. Making. And he's making $15. Let's say this is the one that's in HR. This is the one in payroll. Now. Human Resources goes and changes this to a new phone number. Let's say a, a area code 333 phone number or 330 phone number. And payroll goes and changes this to $17. And they both go and update it at the same time. Far-fetched, yes. Again, if you follow the logic, though, that when you're dealing with tons of different updates and blah, 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 eventually this will happen. Now, what's going to happen? All right. In a simplistic situation, when you say at the same time, we're talking about at the same time on a human scale, right? You know, in other words, you know, if I drop this pen, we'll do a little gravity experiment here. If I drop this pen, you heard it and saw it hit the table at the same time, right? Well, not really. Light travels faster than sound. So actually, you saw it a split second, and, and, and it's smaller than a split second, a split, 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 split second before you heard it. That's like with lightning and thunder, right? That's probably a more realistic thing, you know. Lightning and thunder, if it's far away, you see the flash and hear the thunder, all right? Same thing here, except that on a human scale, it appears to be at the same time. Same thing with this. On, on a human scale, we could say these updates happen at the same time. But in reality, in terms of the computer, one of them happened before the other one. All right? Let's say, for example, the payroll one happened before the HR update. So. The payroll one's going to go and update this information. It's going to take the information that they have on their screen and update that. And it's going to update their wage rate to $17. All right? HR's update then goes through. It's going to take the information on their screen and update it. Change the phone number. And, oh, yeah. It's going to update and set their wage rate back to $15 because that's what HR had on their screen. So, that's not a real good situation, right? Because the one update blew away the other person's update. All right? Now, how can you prevent that from happening? There's, a, there, there's several ways that you can deal with it. All right? The first way, and, and I'm going to say it, and, and um, it, it may sound goofy, but it's an option, and, and it's, it's okay in some situations, is not to worry about it. All right? Obviously, with something like payroll data, that's probably not a good strategy, right? But if it was some other kind of data that maybe wasn't as sensitive as that, you know, you're updating product descriptions and that. If one update well, wipes out the other one, oh well, okay, I guess we have to redo the other one. All right? 
So in some cases, that's an acceptable answer. Some cases, that's an acceptable answer. All right. Other approaches include changing the update statement in this way. This is why it's good to know SQL at this point. And I believe this is called optimistic concurrency. Let's put back up the original information about Bill. Bill Myers. Phone number 440-555-1212. Wage rate $15. I think that's everything. Employee number 100. Now, if the update statement is this, the first scenario I described, the update statement might look like this. Update employee set first name equals bill Last name equals Myers. Because they could have changed those fields, right? There could have been a misspelling of Myers and I was updating it. So I'm going to update everything that's on that screen. Phone equals 440-555-1212. Rate equals 17 because I've changed it from 15 to 17, where employee ID equals 100. So that would be what the payroll department's update statement would look like if we weren't worrying about concurrency. So this is the, you know, this is the Bobby McFerrin method. Don't worry, be happy, just it'll take care of itself. Don't put any effort for it. Which, again, isn't necessarily a good strategy in all situations, but it can be. And this one is probably not a good idea. So, HR goes and does their update. Their SQL statement is going to look like this. And it's going to update the phone number. And it's going to reset the value of their pay rate back to 15 because that's what the HR person has on their screen. Okay. So... That's without worrying about concurrency at all. You have that potential. What would optimistic concurrency say? Optimistic concurrency would say update employee set F name equal to Bill. I'm going to write the update for the... Um, for the payroll department. F name equals Bill. L name equals Myers. Phone equals 440-555-1212. Rate equals 17. Where employee ID equals 100. And, and what do you think is going to be on the AND clause? And F name equals Bill. And L name equals Myers. And phone equals 440. 555-1212 and rate equals 15. So what are we doing here? Effectively, our WHERE clause is seeing did this row change from the time I retrieved it to the time I'm going to update it. Because the WHERE clause is going to contain the original values that that person pulled up on their screen. So in that scenario, I said both HR and payroll pulled up the same data, 
this data, and that's what they pull up originally. They each make their respective changes, go to update them at the same time. And the where clause is going to see, hey, did any of that data change since I retrieved it? All right. Now, in the case of payroll, employee number 100, first name equals Bill, Myers equals that, phone equals that, wage rate equals that. Yeah, it's going to find that row and it's going to allow them to change the wage rate to 17. Now, HR's update comes along. All right. And it tries to do this, update the phone number and update the rate back to what it was when it originally pulled up that data from the screen. Well, look what's going to happen now. Update employee, set, F name equals Bill, L name equals Myers, phone equals 330-555. Rate equals 15. In other words, it's about to undo that change. Now let's look at the where clause. It's going to look and make sure that the values that are currently in the database match the original values that got pulled. Name uh, or ID equals 100. Yep. F name equals Bill. Yep. Last name equals Myers. Yep. Phone number equals that. Yep. Wage rate equals 15. And eh, it doesn't match this record. Therefore, that second update, no records would be updated. And you could look and see, gee, how many records were updated? None were updated. And you could display a, an error message to HR saying that um, your, your update did not work. It did not update any rows in the database. So the idea of optimistic concurrency is before you do an update, you build into the where clause, you build into the where clause, a check to make sure that the values that you're updating haven't changed from when you first retrieved the row. So your program retrieves the data, you physically make changes, you try to do the update. Before the update is done, it via the where clause, it looks to see have those original values changed since when you re retrieved them. If they have, then the where clause won't match up with that row and nothing gets updated. So again, uh, at least you tell the person, hey, your update didn't work, you know, and, you know, maybe you even in your program give a suggestion to say maybe concurrent updates were happening or whatever, all right? Now, that's optimistic, all right? What's pessimistic, <laughs> all right? Pessimistic would, would, again, it would often be done with stored procedures, and it would involve locking data, all right? What do I mean by locking data? By locking data, I mean this. Let's say, again, have the same employee table. Employee number 100, Bill Myers. Phone, 440-555-1212. Wage rate, $15 an hour. With locking, the idea is this. Both payroll and HR go to retrieve this guy to do an update. They both go to retrieve that at the same time. Well, as I said before, on the same time in human terms maybe, not on the same time computer terms. One of them happened before the other one. All right, even if it's you know a fraction fraction of a second. So let's say, for the sake of argument, that payroll got it first. What would happen then is when that data was retrieved and brought to payroll screen, in the database, a lock would be put on that row. A lock is put on that row. What does that mean? That means when HR, a fraction um, of a second earlier, or I'm sorry, later, tries to retrieve it, it'll be told it can't access that record, all right, because someone else has it in use, all right? Now, again, if this is normal kind of stuff, payroll's going to pull up that, make us change, save it, 
and that lock will be taken out and then HR can pull it up. This may actually be transparent to HR, right? There might be a, a code that goes and looks and if it's locked, wait a second and try again. Wait a second and try again until it's unlocked. And maybe do that 10 times to see if it's unlocked. Because again, these updates, don't, it's not like they take hours, right? You bring up the data, you change it, you save it. So with locking, all right, the idea is, is when someone is about to make an update, all right, when someone retrieves data to make an update, you don't allow anyone else to access that data. Now, that can be problematic if that lock never goes away, right? Like if this guy were to crash, all right, or um, the, the worst scenario is what's called a deadly embrace or a deadlock. That would be where two programs each have locked a piece of data in the database and each of them are waiting for the other one to unlock their data before they proceed. So if program A, let's say, Program A and Program B, we have piece of data one and data two. If Program A locks data one and Program B has locked data two and Program B is trying to access data one and program A is trying to access data two, that's a deadlock. That's uh, like the Dr. Seuss one where the northbound and southbound whatever they are. I don't know if you, if you guys remember that one. I guess I'm the only one that, that watches Dr. Seuss at this late stage uh, of my career. But at any rate, uh, both of them have something locked and both of them are waiting for the resource that the other one has locked. That's never going to resolve, right? And that actually can, can cause damage. It can bring down the database and there's, mo there's stuff that you can do to prevent that and monitors, but, you know, that's a potential problem with this locking, all right? The other potential problem that we had uh, in an application I worked years ago is the database wasn't able to lock an individual row. It locked like a group of, 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 of records, all right? It locked like a sector. And the problem with that is, is you're not just locking the one person in. You might be locking a few other people in the database when you go and, and do that. All right. Um, so those are kind of the ways that that deadlock, or I'm sorry, that uh, concurrency is handled. Either you don't worry about it, you say the data, well, you know, not a good chance that, that these two uh, two people will be updating this at the same time. Now let's say, for example, account information on Netflix, all right? If I go in and edit my Netflix account, there's a good chance I'm the only person in the world that's doing that, right? I mean, I'm the only one that has my ID my, and password. Conceivably, it could be my wife doing it at the same time, right? But, again, that's pretty unlikely. And if I change my phone number and for whatever reason it doesn't work, well, I just go and change it again. It's not that big a deal. It's not like a financial transaction. So for that sort of update, you might say, yeah, I'm just not going to worry about concurrency. But for the for, for more critical sort of things where, you know, sensitive data, financial data, you would want to be very aware of these sort of concurrency issues because, again, any sort of uh, dis discrepancy is, is going to be bad news. All right? Again, these are not features built into access. These are features that um, more robust databases support, like SQL Server or Oracle. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is some of these things I'm talking about are a combination of what the database supports and what you put in your application to do. And some of it, again, you can include some of this code uh, in stored procedures as well. Any questions at this point on this? All right, we have a couple minutes left, but not time to start a new uh, topic, so we will just um, recess here. All right, see you over in Lamb.